have people on the Zoom too that are going to get to see Pinal's program. So um, our speaker tonight, uh, Pinal Merlin, and her program is um, called The Earth Laughs in Flowers, which is a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson. And she'll be telling us about the wildflowers that we can expect to be seeing and also about their wildflowers and their pollinators. Um, and our this is a special spring because our rainfall has been plentiful. And so nature throws an exuberant party in honor of that. The temperatures have been and the rains have been cool. So we're not seeing the party yet, but um, Pinal will be able to give us some clues on where to look for the flowers and um, also tell us more about their inner lives, their pollinators, and uh, why, why we have them, why we are so blessed with them. Um, we'll look at various germination strategies and also some of the tactics um, that have evolved with flowers and their pollinators, which is really a fascinating area of study. So Pinal Merlin is a nationally known speaker, naturalist, and writer, and we're just so fortunate that she also lives in Tucson and has been active over the years in the Native Plant Society. Um, she has taught history, uh, natural history at the University of Arizona, and also was um, a coordinator for the Jaguar Project a few years ago, has written numerous articles, um, and is an all-around critter wrangler who has um, helped with providing animals for various nature programs. So I'm going to um, welcome, I'd like you all to welcome Pinal. I'm going to turn this over to him. There's a little click on this. Okay, do you want to click it on? Let's see. You'll try. Does that work? Everybody can hear? Okay, great. I can hear you on the Zoom. Oh, good. And you know about using the that the pointer. Right. Okay. Well, you know, just the fact that everybody is here really speaks to the fact that we love flowers. They have a really profound effect on us. There's no denying when you see traffic backed up for miles along the road trying to get to Kitt Peak to see the flowers that there's something special about them. And well, that's we're all native plant people, so we know. <laughs> but so, you know, we don't always get an exuberant bloom. And this year could be, depending on if it'll stop raining and cold. Um, but what makes or breaks a good bloom year? And I'm going to do a little review because I know most everybody knows this, but for, for the few. Um, so most of our plants that bloom in the spring are more mesic adapted plants. They're not really desert adapted plants at all. And so they um, need one inch of rain in the cool weather of October, November, you know, sometime like that. Uh, to actually germinate. And that one inch kind of assures them that there's probably going to be enough soil moisture that even if they don't make a huge bloom, if it doesn't ever rain again that winter, they'll still eke out one flower maybe and make a couple of seeds. So it's worth the chance to germinate then. But how do they know that it's a one inch rain? Um, because they actually have a, um, where's my thing? Okay. They actually have a inhibitor seed coat on the seeds that takes an inch of rain to wash it off. And that's what tells them that, okay, time to germinate now. So, um, am I pointing at this? Yeah, let me make sure it turns on. Oh. Pointed at the projector. Mm -hmm. 
the suspense. There you go. Okay. Thank you. So when we get these really dramatic shows, these really, um, you know, fabulous shows like this was last year. And last year, of course, was one of our big, big flower years. Uh, and this is over by Ajo. Um, you know, we get these dramatic displays and, um, but they, they don't, I mean, people often, and I just heard the other day at Tohono Chul that a lot of people were coming in to buy wildflower seeds and planting them now. So they don't know that it actually happens that the germination is in the fall. So a lot of people are thinking to, you know, they want the flower seeds. They don't have the background to understand that this is happening in the fall. So um, what happens is you get these wonderful displays. You're certainly not going to have enough pollinators because there's literally billions of flowers and there can't possibly be enough pollinators for all of them. Um, but what happens is in the fall, the plants germinate and you get these basal rosettes. This is a penstemon. And it sits at the ground level, which is a microclimate close to the ground. It's a little bit warmer. And they don't do a lot in the winter. They might grow a little bit, but they grow you know, in the early months when they first germinate. And then again in the spring, and then they bolt um, you know, when, it, when it finally warms up. And so then you get you know, the big shows. Um, so lupin is one of our old standbys. It always comes out. And the reason for that is because it's one of the few that will germinate on a half an inch of rain. So that one will come out you know, pretty reliably. And it's a remarkable plant. Not only is it really pretty, but it's got a whole suite of tricks up its leaves in order to attract pollinators and to you know, make sure that it's it's got the upper leaf here. Um, so we can see the hand-shaped leaves, which I'll just show here, that are sun trackers. So all day long, they're tracking the sun, moving with the sun and absorbing heat. And remember in the, in the spring, the mornings can still be chilly and bees don't prefer to fly until it's 60 degrees. And so lupin by following the sun, pulling in more heat, is actually showing up brighter in UV light for the bees to see. And they want to come to a warm flower. So they're being, it's luring the pollinators into itself in over other, other possible plants that would be open. Um, and one of the things, well, we can't see the banner. I'll show you the next one. Oops, sorry, I haven't got the, there. So one of the things that happens is you, you have to manage your pollinators. You know, you can't just stand there and look pretty because there's a whole lot of work to be done here and you have to really have all these, uh, you know, things in your favor. So the, the banner petal here shows that it hasn't been pollinated. And once it has been, this little cream yellow spot is going to turn pink. And the whole point of that is it tells the pollinator, this flower is done, move on, nothing to see here go over here. And so they're, they're directing traffic basically in this way. And um, lupin, I mean, no, uh, aloe clover is really a favorite with most people until they find out that it's hiding a secret, that it's a hemiparasite. And then the mood turns dark. You know? So, um, but why is it a hemiparasite? And usually, what, what makes a plant turn to the dark side? You know, there's several things, and it's always related to lack of resources. So it can be short growing season, check. Um, intense competition for resources, check. Um, or soils, uh, desert soils, poor nutrients, check. So it's got a lot of motivations to um, turn that way and try to parasitize something else. And it will parasitize a lot of other different ephemerals, actually. But if it finds itself germinated next to or nearby to a lupin, it just hit the jackpot. Because lupin is a nitrogen fixer. So that's a huge plus. And other pluses, too, I'll mention. 
But what it does is um, it sends hostorial, little hostoria over to the lupin roots. They don't have a good root system, and that's true of most of the um, parasitic and hemiparasitic plants is that they don't have a strong root system. They're relying on the hostoria to sneak over, attach on to the host plant and take the water and nutrients from the host. Um, but this is a facultative parasite. It can, um, it can be autotrophic if it needs to, if it doesn't find itself with a host nearby. It's never as robust, but um, if it does have a host, it's, it's much stronger. So within two hours of latching onto a pen, to a uh, lupin, it has a fully functioning root system. So, which, uh, you know, otherwise it might take quite a while to develop your root system and everything else. So that's, that's a big plus right there. And then lupin has um, alkaloids. And so it absorbs those same toxins into its tissues and that reduces herbivory by caterpillars of moths and butterflies. So it's got a reduced herbivory, which means it has that much more energy to put into flowering and making seeds. And um, it is, the nectar is not affected by the uh, toxins. And so it's still attracting plenty of pollinators um, to it to, to get pollinated. So it's really a win for the owl clover, but not so much for the lupin. So it's still really a pretty plant though. So, um, so I should mention too, another tactic that uh, lupin and actually a number, many of the um, annual ephemeral plants have is the hedger bets uh, syndrome, where they, even in the best years, not all of their seeds will germinate. So some proportion of their seeds will not germinate and may not for 10 years. And so that way there's always a seed bank left so that if you have some really bad years or you lose your whole crop and you had a good bloom and something happened, there was a catastrophe and you lost your whole crop, there's still a seed bank waiting. So um, it's a great strategy. There actually are some moths that do this too that um, don't um, hatch the first year, they might wait a second or even a third year. And I suspect there probably are other things that do this because it's a good idea, a good strategy. So. so with the other factor that happens in arid lands, why you don't see this in other places, there are many reasons you wouldn't see it in the tropics, you know, um, is they need open spaces, open land. And in our desert, uh, perennial plants have to commandeer their water, so they're spaced out. So they're controlling all that water that they need to survive, and there are big spaces in between them. Now, in years like this, it's been raining and raining and raining, and so there's lots of excess water. Lots of plants can come in, but they actually have open space to do that. So if it was already occupied by another plant, it would, it would be a lot harder to make these mass carpets of flowers that we see. So, and, and, and then, you know, just these tremendous shows and again, not enough pollinators. So a lot of these plants, you know, they have to come up with other ideas if they're not gonna get a pollinator. And some things will um, self-pollinate, but of course, big downside to self-pollinating. And every single plant on the planet has a differently shaped pollen grain. And so, it only wants its specific pollen to get to it. And pollen is very expensive to make uh, metabolically for the plant. So they don't wanna waste that resource. And so they wanna make sure that they're getting a, a flower constant pollinator. And if you get, I'll show you just a second here. Here's, a, here's one that's pretty adaptable. Now, uh, creosote will try for, um, pollination, and if it isn't getting pollinated by an insect or whatever, it'll self-pollinate. And how do we know that this has already been pollinated? Because it's turning the petals 90 degrees, and it's showing the pollinators again, move on, this has already been done, go to another flower. 
And so it's it, because you don't want them wasting time. You know, we got a short time here. We got to get everything done. So, so they're they're quite effectively managing their pollinators. But so all these different plants want is connectus. Um, all these different plants are wanting to attract pollinators if they can. So they're producing pollens that are very specific to the pollinator they want because they co-evolve together, of course. And so it's all um, uh, the exact amount of amino acids and proteins and, and sugars that the pollinator needs. And how you know if you have a good pollinator who's constant going only to your flowers is you look at the, you, we can tell because we can look at the bee baskets on the bee's legs. And if they're all one color, it's pretty much going to the same kind of flower. If they're all different colors, it's going to different different flowers and collecting. Um, so it's, it's you know easy enough to tell, but it's very, very important to them to have a, a pretty constant, uh, reliable pollinator. And the other, the other thing is that if they get the wrong pollen put on the stigma of their flower, the stigmas are always sticky and that effectively clogs the power, the, uh, the flower, and so it can't reproduce. So that flower has just been ruined as far as reproduction goes. So it's another reason to be just fussy about this. So who are these good pollinators? And of course, anybody with a fuzzy body would work but some are more constant and reliable than others. And of course the bees are um, wonderful. Lantana is another plant that changes color of flowers once it's pollinated. So, and, and lots of, um, you know, plants use bees as pollinator. And um, the Dicolostemma is a, is a great one. And um, these were used by, um, native peoples a lot because there's a little corn at the bottom, you know, they grow in these rocky hillsides and I don't know how they gather them because the corns are down in, wedged in these little rocks and stuff, the big rocks, but, um, and they're small, I don't know, half an inch to an inch. So you have to get a lot of them to um, make a meal or even a snack. But what the native people did was um, wait till after they set seed before they harvested them. And then they would also, after the harvest, they would also replant the cornlets so that they had a steady, um, they didn't deplete the resource. So, which is pretty cool. So, and uh, one of our really beautiful showy ones, um, the delphinium, another bee pollinated, but you know, you can say there's bee pollinated, but you hummingbirds will go to anything. You know, if they if they're they need some nectar, they're gonna to go to any plant that's got nectar. So um, you know, any port in a storm. But what I love about this is again another plant that's used a lot by native peoples. And among the Navajo, they make a blue dye with this plant. But the best thing about it, I think, is that it's used for uh, fertility in women and goats. <laughs> I'm leaving it right there. So there, even even the leaves are really pretty on that plant. It's a lovely plant, and I don't think we ever see enough of that. I I think there should be lots more of them. And here, this is not obviously a native. It's a fillery that's introduced, and but has naturalized and is everywhere. And it's also called heron's bill or crane's bill because you know the the beak on the flowers there. But bees love this, and it's one of the first that's out in the spring, an early early bloomer. So it's actually a resource for our native bees um, to use. Um, but look at how cool the seeds are. So these seeds, you know, come off with this spiral, and when it rains, the spiral unwinds and it actually drills the seed down into the soil. So, what, so one of the reasons it's pretty successful. So who are not good pollinators? Non-fuzzy bodied people like ants, 
Okay. And not only do ants um, not have fuzzy bodies, but they secrete a chemical on their bodies that kills fungus and uh, bacteria, but also it kills pollen. So definitely not good pollinators. However, some plants use ants um, as defenders. And so they have extra floral nectaries that they attract ants and give them a reward of nectar. Then it's mostly sugar, maybe 95% sugars, but that's enough for the ants. And then they can actually um, uh, defend the plant because now it's a resource for them against um, other herbivores or things like that that might want to eat the plant. So there, there's that function with ants. And, um, and then some plants like silene has these little sticky catchfly things. Uh, that's a common name, catchfly. Um, so little barriers so that ants can't get up there and get at the pollen. So um, everybody, every plant has got it figured out to, you know, how to minimize your predators or herbivores and maximize your pollinators. Bat pollinated plants. So we're really lucky here to have the uh, nectar feeding bats and the uh, uh, leptonicterus. And um, the tongue is absolutely incredible. It's, it's extendable. I mean, it's extendable, but it's also ex expandable too. And um, it's, it's really quite amazing to see them. And they are so fast, they're not even hesitating at the flowers. It almost just likes a, like the briefest pause and then they're off again. So, but they're apparently getting enough at every, every hit that they're being quite successful. And um, obviously these bats get dusted with pollen. I mean, that's more than dusting, that's like coated with pollen. And um, even though the bats will hang up and clean their fur because they get some protein from eating the pollen, they're not gonna get all that protein off. So they're gonna, and this is uh, octopus agave, that uh, they're definitely gonna be spreading that pollen to other plants and it's just like, it doesn't matter where they get into the plant. There's pollen on them everywhere, so it's going to get onto another onto another um, plant. And they're just adorable. Look at how tubby fat he is. Um, and they do actually at, at times when they've really been out for a night on the town, they just look like balloons, little balloons with wings, and then they hang up and digest that meal. But the aside here is that she's also pregnant because this is. Um, this is over by Ajo, and all these females are coming up from the big maternity colony there at um, in Oregon Pipe. And um, that's, I think, the biggest maternity colony in, in the US of these bats. And um, so when they arrive here from Mexico, they're already all pregnant. And then in, in uh, June, July, the little guys are born. And in August, you've got a huge influx. They're already flying by August. But, um, but they just love this. It's, and it's fun to see them being so happy. Um, I don't know. You're hitting, the, you're hitting the red dot. I can see the red dot, but it's not also there. Oh, okay. there we go. Okay. So, you know, different agaves um, will also, um, they produce copious amounts of nectar. I mean, for bats. And it's the right proportion of, of uh proteins, amino acids, you know, everything that the bat needs. Okay. And if you shook that thing, you would actually be drenched in nectar. So it's, it's really huge amounts. And that's pretty expensive. But remember, the plant spent its whole life doing this. So it's going to put everything out to, to get pollinated. And like Palmer agave would um, actually shut down production of nectar in one panicle to move it over to others. And then some plants will actually, you know, move them over to the next plant. And, you know, so they're definitely uh, directing traffic this way. And the sphinx moth is a, another pollinator that's really a cool one because so many of the plants we all know and love that are night bloomers um, or afternoon bloomers, uh, the sphinx moth pollinates. And the tongue is longer than the body because it's going for those long tubular flowers. 
And they're also called hummingbird moths because for the obvious reason, they're big, they make whirring sounds with their... So they do go to Datura and it is noticed that they seem to get a little bit inebriated on the flowers, which is, um, to when you really think about it, it's this little thing with a pinhead sized brain and it's eating this you know, nectar from a, a very toxic flower, you would guess it would get inebriated or, uh, but they like it, they come back. <laughs> so, um, and the night blooming Sirius, that's another one that they pollinate. And, um, and usually if you're not getting fruit set on your Sirius, you, you know that there's some kind of a problem with your pollinator that you, maybe your neighbors are spraying pesticides or things like that. Um, they have to check that out. And the ajo lily is another one that the, um, the sphinx moth pollinates. And this is actually, although it's considered a night bloomer, it actually opens about 3.30 in the afternoon, four o'clock. And you can see, you know, when the uh, stamens and everything are nice and fresh, you can tell. And then the, the flowers from yesterday kind of look a little droopy and you know, they're still open, just waiting for another chance, but um, but they look spent. And and here's coming in. And uh, my friend Doug got, to, I asked him to, to see if he could get some pictures. And um, he went out one evening and got this first picture in just a few minutes. And then he went out for nights and nights and nights after and never could get another picture. So I was like, oh, thanks. So, um, yeah, pretty cool creatures. And here's the leaves of, agave, of the um, ajo lily, cali uh, Hesperocallus, and they're everywhere. They're up all over the place. There's going to be a big bloom when, whenever it warms up enough and stops raining. And um, Anza Borrego was saying they were going to have an explosion of ajo lilies. So. I'd like to see an explosion of ajo lilies, but so anyway, there's quite a few of them over in western part of the state, over by ajo and that area um, that are just waiting. And this is a young plant, okay, only a few leaves. And a lot of times when they're young, maybe the first year or so, and they only have two leaves, they won't bloom. They they've got to spend the energy building the the bulb which also was eaten. And that's why they're ajo lilies, because ajo means garlic in Spanish. And um, so everybody liked to eat them, including um, kangaroo rats. And here's one that's an adult, an established, uh, quite a few years old plant. And this has a root, you know, because they germinate on the surface, just a few inches under the surface. And the root um, just keeps drilling down and you know the plant eventually the bulb starts like two feet down deep in the sand and um, a number of years ago I was out there and there was a really nice bloom and I had a group going out in 10 days and I thought there the flowers will be spent so I had water in the car so I was pouring water on all of them just hoping they'd last for the 10 days and when I came back with the group they're all all had gone to seed, you know. And um, so I said, I, I asked Mark Dim, I said, well, what went wrong there? And he said, how much water did you give him? I said, well, I gave him about a cup. And he said, if the roots down, two feet down the bulb, you know, give him a gallon and see what happens. But actu actually, it, it's true because um, they will actually come in back into bloom, even though they've stopped, if they get another big rain. So this, you can tell what kind of a year it is. <clears throat> Although this was last year when we had good rains, but it, this is a real shorty, the real real little guy close to the ground, and most of them were. And it depends on soil substrates as well, because if you're in, um, you know, the real rocky stuff, uh, they tend not to be as tall. So, um, but even though they had a lot of water, but in the sand dunes in a good year, you can get them almost five feet tall. Um, which is really something to see. So, and this was uh, also last year, but again, more in the sandy areas. And um, they just keep having more and more flowers, so they can last for quite a long time. 
<clears throat> the bloom in a good year. Um, and then, like I say, if if they all went to seed and suddenly you got another big rain enough to get down to the bulb, it would go back into flower again. And butterfly pollinators. You know, there's a whole lot of plants that like butterflies. Who doesn't like butterflies? You know, uh, Verbena, Abronia, um, which, you know, carpets the desert, the dunes and stuff in the in uh, these kinds of years. So that's a, and all the, the butterfly plants generally have a landing platform for the butterflies because A, they taste with their feet and B, they like to perch, you know, when they, um, when they uh, eat. And let me show you, here's a uh, cephalanthus button willow uh, and a pipeline on it. So it's not quite a landing platform form is round, but it's still a landing platform for them. And this is an incredibly toxic plant, apparently. So it uh, will cause seizures and convulsions and possibly death. Um, so you don't want to go pet it or, you know, uh, lick it or anything like that, but it doesn't bother the, the, the insects at all. So, um, but it's really pretty and you find it more in uh, wet areas, like you'd see it at Sabino Canyon, um, uh, just past the dam and places like that. You'd see it there and uh, wherever there's some water. But it's really, and it's just covered with butterflies. It's just really a cool plant. It would be a neat one to put in if it wasn't so toxic. And we all know immediately it's a hummingbird plant, Livardia. Um, but the interesting thing is, it's not red for the hummingbirds because hummingbirds have full color spectrum vision. They can see every color. It's red because bees don't see red. And this is disattracting the non-pollinators that they don't want, stealing the nectar and making it attractive to the pollinator that they do want. So, um, so if that was any other color, yellow or whatever, the hummingbirds would still go to it. And hummingbirds go to columbine and all kinds of different plants like that. But so quite a few plants have disincentives to keep away uh, nectar thieves. And here's Acosta's um, hummingbird. And they're, of course, coming up right now, coming up from Mexico. And I just, well, I'll show you. Um, Chuparosa is coming on. And now Chuparosa is having an interesting year too. Um, this is Wild Burrow Canyon. And that usually has some of the most spectacular Chuparosas in Eastern part of the state. And they get in amongst up the trees and bushes and they'll get even 10 feet tall and quite 10 feet across, but they're protected, you know, because this is a cool air drainage, although I'm pretty sure this is a south facing canyon, but it's still a cool air drainage. And when I went out a few days ago to check it out, um, the ones that were really in deep among the trees looked nice, but everything else looked pretty, pretty sorry, like it had been a, a they'd been freezing, a, frozen a few times. So, but it's a very cool place. It's actually a good place for a uh, plant walk to in Wildboro. Um, so the chuparosa, and again, clearly we know it's a hummingbird plant. Um, and Lynn's favorite, uh, coral bean. So, it's so beautiful. And this I just saw in Saguaro National Park East the other day. And this is some... Um, uh, you make that a little Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, um, Dahlia. Polkra. Dahlia Polkra. So, um, and this was being worked over by Acosta's hummingbird. And he just was on that. He stayed there for more than five minutes, just going from flower to flower to flower. So um, it doesn't look like a pollinate, a hummingbird pollinated plant, but like I say, it had pollen, it had nectar rather. So, and it's, it, there's not much blooming out there right now. So that is actually, was a good resource for him. And what happens with all these um, plants that are trying to attract hummingbirds is, again, there just can't be enough hummingbirds. 
this, this can't be. And this is a um, calliope, our smallest little tiny hummingbird. And she's just covered in pollen. So what the plants are doing is not time sharing the hummingbird, but space sharing it. So one plant will put its pollen on her breast, another will put it on her head, a different one will put it on her back. And so whichever plant she goes to, that pollen's gonna get to that, that same plant. And she's just, you know, um, they're utilizing every inch of her to um, you get the pollen where, the, where it needs to go, which is again, pretty cool. And she gets a reward because not only is she getting nectar from the plants, but she's getting some uh, proteins and stuff from the pollens that she licks off her fur, her feathers rather, so. So with some of the plants are generalists and um, you know, anybody, they'll take anybody. And Ocotillo is one of those. Um, and just at the park yesterday, not even flower buds yet. Uh, just uh, very surprising, but it's cooler there. And they're just, they're clearly several weeks behind. So, uh, but a lot of birds go to Chiparosa, I mean, um, Ocotillo because uh, it's got good pollen, I mean, nectar. And so the hummingbirds go to it, but cardinals, um, orioles, uh, woodpeckers love love nectar, so they go to it. Um, so it's a real popular uh, plant. And people used to uh, use it too. The native people would uh, take the flowers and put them in water, squish them, squeeze them, and it would give a drop of nectar. And so it would make it sweeter, a sweet drink for them. So. Oh, sorry, wrong place. So uh, New Mexico thistle is another generalist, which everything can go to, but butterflies, bees, hummingbirds, uh, everything, and, you know, very popular. And this thing is actually a wonderful plant because uh, goldfinches love it, and they love the seeds, too. And I had one in the yard that I watered a few years ago um, diligently, and it had 200 flower heads on it. It was huge, and I had gold pinches everywhere. It was really a fun, fun thing to see that. And I just wanted to throw in this because this is going to happen next month. Okay, this in April, April. And this is all these are bee holes. And so usually these big open flat areas is where you get the bee emergences. And then you don't nobody knows it's going to happen until suddenly, you know, you see the emergence holes. And these are usually um, Diodaisy or Rinconis who um, pollinate the, so the Palaverde blooms and things like that. So um, they have these little turrets here and there. And this is supposedly to deter hoverflies because hoverflies come in and they hover and they actually flip their eggs into the holes and the egg will land on the larvae inside and parasitize it and eat it when they hatch. Um, so obviously that's not a desirable thing. And so the bees try to make these little turrets or chimneys to make it a little bit harder for the um, hoverfly to get in there to do that. But, um, I don't know how successful it is, but um, so what happens is the females are minding their own business and they emerge, and this is what happens. There's a female under there. I did have the sound. I don't know where the sound went. But um, so they're called bee balls. And um, I don't know how she survives, but she does. And um, so these are real attractive to lots of birds and other predators because those are mostly male bees who have no stingers, so they're really easy to eat, you know. And the female's probably so dazed at that point, she's not going to bother anybody. Um, but, but anyway, so this is the kind of thing that we might see next month. The trick is finding out where it's happening. But, so, um, okay, this is over by Ajo um, in the Chuak, Sikork Mountains, whatever. And uh, there's a little po uh, population of red mariposas over there, which is worth the drive over just to see that. So, so we we just barely had the quickest look 
you know, at, at some of the flowers, you know, there are very few of the flowers and, you know, what they're doing out there. Um, and it kind of makes me think of um, Iris Murdoch, the writer who said, people from a planet without flowers must think we would be mad with joy the whole time to have such, such things about us. And I think she was right. So, so. <laughs> well, we'll take questions from the room for now. It can be helpful if you kind of restate the question just right. that yep. way folks yep. want to be sure. Yep. Yes. Yeah, uh, like the first slide, for a while, your first slide uh -huh. is an example of what my question is. And explosive numbers of flowers might be an F2. The result of an F2 also, so the primary flowers would bloom early, put out an F2, and, and that would be explosive. Is that in the equation at all? I don't know, because I, I don't even know what's going on now. You know, it, it's just, it's, uh, there's, uh, I, I actually was talking to Mark Dimmitt recently, trying to, you know, get some of these ideas, you know, figured out. And his answer was, nature is incomprehensibly um, intricate and under, un, non understandable. <laughs> I said, okay, well, that answer does, you know, tells me. Okay, I don't need and Do you, anybody else yeah. want to answer it? Pardon? It's a question. I um, want to say it again and I'll. The um, explosive numbers of, of wildflowers, like poppies, might be the result of an F2 generation. If the, if the primary flowers uh, bloom and are pollinated early, then it would be a huge. Windfall to the species of the, the F2. F2 would proliferate all over the place. That's just another scenario different from the ones you were talking about. Right. But I don't I don't think they can do it quick enough. Like that, I don't know. That's yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. I don't think they, they can it, do it. it. Not be poppy, but something else that's right. capable of an F2 with the same right. The same, uh, as far as I know, that doesn't work, but I don't know because it's just too short a season for them to germinate and do all that. Um, uh, you know, but there, that said, there's another thing going on is that germination strategies are different in different areas for the same plants. So, um, what we know happens here around the Tucson area is way different than what happens over in Western Arizona because those plants have to be even more adaptable because it's drier and they might get a rain in, you know, say October or maybe December or whatever. And they're gonna, they've gotta just rush to germinate and um, they'll, they'll bolt much quicker than we will here. And it's warmer over there too. So, um, you know, so they will use a different strategy because the conditions are different and they've evolved under those conditions. And that's part of the whole point of getting seeds that are have been um, grown in your area because you don't want to plant seeds from another area that are not expecting what you know we're going to get. So, but, but I'm pretty sure that the answer is that they just don't have time to do a second generation, um, you know, in that short of. Anybody else? Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, I got one. Earlier, you mentioned um, that there's a big downside to self pollination. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if you could just elaborate on why self pollination might not be such a great strategy. Well, because you don't have any genetic diversity going on, and so if you don't have genetic diversity, and basically not not truly, but basically you're almost cloning yourself. You're getting the same genes then you don't have adaptability. You're, you're adapted to the conditions as they are, but with those conditions change, you don't have that um, adaptability or plasticity that you can change with conditions. Um, and that's, uh, not, that's something that is totally irrelevant to plants, but it happens with the, the jaguars at this northern edge of their territory. They're much more plastic than animals in the middle because conditions are very different here and they're much more adaptable. So you couldn't take a jaguar from Southern Mexico or Central America and move it up here and expect it to be successful. But the ones that do live, you know, right on borderlands area are gonna be successful. So plants, animals, same kind of a thing, not plasticity. Yeah. Another question I have, just your 
are well versed in naturalism generally, do you find that there is a lot of flurivory by little critters like Harris ground squirrels? Oh, absolutely. Like okay, good question about the herbivory by the ground squirrels and the little animals. And absolutely, because a lot of times you'll see um, the hedgehog buds and you just, you know, go the next day to see the flower and it's eaten, you know, and it's all the time. So the flowers get eaten a lot. And um, I can't remember what the plant was, but I actually was watching a rock squirrel get on top. It was actually a saguaro, a, a shorter saguaro that it could reach it from a tree. And it, it uh, had the flower buds all over it. And he just munched them all. He just went and ate them all. You know, and it's a food resource and it's a good one. So you can't blame them. But yeah, there's a lot of herbivory on desert flowers. Um, so I have a question in the Zoom here. Uh, well, I'll start with a comment. One is I've seen lizards jump up and eat flowers from my Decliptera. So obviously reptiles <laughs> are getting in on the action as well. Yep. Um, the question is, how do rare plants get pollinated? It always seems odd to me that plants that are really spread out get pollinated successfully if the bees have to travel really far. Yeah, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that because they are spaced far apart and a bee is just not going to go, you know, in the hopes that it's going to find another one of those flowers, you know, a mile away or something. So so I'm not sure how they're doing it if, if they're not self-pollinating. I don't know, maybe they're, um, I don't know the answer to that one. You got any ideas, anybody else? Well, that's why they're rare. That's that, that's why they're, rare. they're spread apart and therefore not getting pollinated, possibly that's right. the one. Right, right, so. Cool, any well, other questions? Um, well, your comment at the end about the Bouvardia, and you know, we hear so much about red tubular flowers attracting hummingbirds. But then you were saying hummingbirds can see all the colors. So is would the case be that those red tubular flowers then it wouldn't be just the bouvardia that's that's doing no. that to just to, to keep the bees away or to whisper. Right. No, so all all the oh uh, the questions about you know the red tubular flowers and hummingbirds, and they have co-evolved, and all these plants have co-evolved co-evolved with their pollinators to provide exactly what they need to dissuade other pollinators and all that. So they're very intricately tied together. And it's really to the plant plant's um, interest and advantage to make sure that it's giving the pollinator what it needs so that it's coming back to that plant and coming back to the next of those plants that it sees instead of saying, I wonder what that one, you know, so, um, so they're definitely luring uh, hummingbirds and hummingbirds have learned red tubular flowers always give me a, a, a nice you know meal. And um, by the way, hummingbirds only get, they can only get six um, milliliters, six, um, to, and that fills their crop. So that's not a lot, but they go to 2000 flowers a day you know, to, in order to survive. But um, but they would go to any color flower, you know, if it was yellow or orange or um, you know any any other color, they would go to it like the the costas that was working over the um, the flower in the park the other day, the uh, dahlia, and um, you know they just go wherever the nectar is. But what the plant is doing is encouraging constancy by giving them exactly what they want. And then they want to go back to the next one and the next one that they see. So it's, it's more the dissuading of the bees that the, is, the red color is all about because bees don't see red. And that's why we have so many yellow flowers in the desert because we got 1200 species of native bees and they see yellow best. So that's why we have yellow flowers predominating and um, anything like that, like, like the chuparosas and the buvardias are dissuading those bees because there are a lot of them and they don't want the bees. So it's, it's really much more of a dissuading of that pollinator than it is attracting hummingbirds. So, and, and everybody thinks you have to put the red dye in the hummingbird feeders and stuff, but you know, that's even not even good for them, so. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you so much.